Many of the most eminent names in literature have been drawn to puppetry. In recent times, there have been Addison, Fielding, Antonio Jose da Silva, Kleist, Goethe, Georges Sand, Valien Klan, Lorca, Strindberg, Maeterlinck, Beckett, Craig. Craig is distinguishable from the others in that he was a fine artist and a scenic designer, as much or more than he was a writer. In fact, thanks to the modernists who fell in love with puppetry at the beginning of the, 19th, of the 20th century, the finest productions employing this performing art are now a fusion of the fine arts with forms of theater, including dance, opera, circus, and adapted te text. All the finest puppeteers of our time have a background in sculpture or painting or scenic design. Puppetry is essentially a hybrid, but a theater of and for the eye. Professor Henrik Jurkowski, how do I do this? I do that, do I? Do I do that? Yes. Professor Henrik Jurkowski, a Polish theorist, writer, historian, and teacher, who applied the majority of his talents to the study of puppetry, wrote a book on Craig, which I edited in 2007, but is so far unpublished, except I believe in Serbo-Croat. Um, naturally, mm -hmm. the book, which draws on works in Eastern European languages, a lot of which he spoke, goes into some depth in the exploration of the puppet art. Yurkowski died last January, and my presentation, my presentation, which consists almost entirely of extracts uh, from the fourth chapter of his book, entitled Craig's Laboratory, is intended as a tribute to him. The words that follow are Henrik's, not mine. I have taken from this chapter and edited some of it because it's much, much longer than this, even though this is pretty long. The focus of his book is on certain fields of Craig's activities and ideas to discover what his intentions for theater really were and what has been the true legacy of a man so immersed in all the arts of theater. There have been many simplifications and misconceptions in the interpretation of his work, not least in his controversial concept of the uber marionette and his interest in puppets as a form of impersonal theater. I believe that most of the existing commentaries attaching to his uber marionette theory need corrections and additions, and a complete and competent exam of Craig's romance with puppet theater is overdue. My own relationship, that's to say Henrik's, with the subject is integral to my lifelong adventures in the research of puppetry in the context of world culture and the history of the human theater. The puppet as simulacrum, the substitution of a human being, has infiltrated every area of culture and art. Its relationship to the biological actor defines its presence in the theater, not necessarily as material artifact, but often as notion, as idea, with all its numerous connotations. Over a hundred years have gone by since the appearance of Craig's first essays of 1905. They came as a jolt and a stimulus to the European theater and have had an immense influence on its development ever since. This influence and its effects are still felt, even if many now attribute them to later other innovators. Craig's ideas were a reaction to the prevailing realism and naturalism in European theater, to some extent connected with 19th century pragmatism in philosophy and economics, one of whose side effects was the commercialization of art. As a young man, influenced by the poets and the artists of his time, Craig made the acquaintance of the new modernist tendencies in art and social life and lived them eagerly and intensely as the spiritual challenges of a new epoch. His concept of theater was that of an autonomous art form independent of literature, believing that only a new kind of playwright, playwright dramaturg, in tandem with a designer could bring about the renaissance of theater. 
The number of his staged works may be small, but we must remember that for most of the creative life, Craig dedicated himself to experiment. Not for any particular venue, but in his miniature model theatres with their manipulated fat figures. He created more in his head than he ever presented to a theatre public. In the case of Craig, it would be better to widen our notion of practice and understand it as creation and creativity. When he abandoned acting in 1887, 1897, he was 25, Craig devoted himself to graphic art and scenic design. From 1900, his woodcuts began to be published in books, periodicals, and as separate sheets. The list is long, and these graphics are an essential part of Craig's legacy. Special attention should be given to the appreciations in the catalogues of the design exhibitions of the time. He took an active part in these exhibitions, especially in the first years of the century, as they were a good place to propagate his theatrical ideas. In reality, Craig was not a playwright, and true to the spirit of modernism, he was striving for theatre's liberation from the domination of literature. All his theatre projects are but records of his ideas and conceptions. His mini plays, motions they were called, for the puppet theatre, with a unique exception. In England, as stage director and designer, he worked either with amateurs or with actors employed for a predetermined repertory. In the first case, he could taste the freedom of innovation and experiment. In the second, he was under pressure from the regular demands of production in a professional context. In Germany, Italy, and Russia, he worked with theater ensembles which followed a certain style or tradition. He wasn't happy with any of them. In 1905, having settled in Berlin, Craig acquired a workshop where he did some work for Otto Brahm and Max Reinhardt. Here he designed settings and costumes for their projects to make money, but also made drawings of his own dreams and ideas. At that time, his dream of running a theatre school was still remote, and there was little present hope of his taking over a theatre in England, especially as he'd started a new period in his life as a designer in Germany. The drawings of the series, The Steps, I wish I had a picture of them, we recall were the result of this need. But soon there appeared a new interest, puppets. Baron Otto von Tauber has supplied us with valuable evidence. Paying a visit to Craig's workshop, Tauber saw Craig operate a marionette. <clears throat> he bought a marionette almost as big as a human being. Where from, I do not know. It was an old figure with only a body, head, and arms. It was placed next to him on a pedestal covered with black velvet. It was a feminine figure, the face and the hair giving the impression of the Rococo style. All the paint had already come off, and what remained was the bare wood. But it was still full of expression. Craig led me to her, took her hands and her head, and moved them in accordance with their mechanism into various positions. With the motion of the limbs, the face also seemed to change, constantly showing a variety of expressions, sometimes really exciting. I was especially moved by her helplessness, by the limitations of this marionette being. But at one moment, Craig arranged the puppet's arm so that she looked with all her fixity of expression, as if, along with Craig, she was ready to fell anyone standing in her way. And so this lifeless, dumb idol represented something inhuman, or more exactly, something superhuman. We don't know how much these rehearsals with a marionette influenced Craig's decision to found his own theater with impersonal actors. The fact is that in 1905, he initiated plans for an international theater of the ideal actor. As usual, he found support and encouragement in the person of his friend and protector, Count Harry Kessler. And three years before publication in the mask of his controversial essay, The Actor and the Uber Marionette, Craig started to organize an international theater of Uber <coughs> Marionettes. This project has up to now hardly been referred to by researchers of Craig's work. 
Surprisingly, Craig himself, in his essays and memoirs, written some time later, says nothing about it. Only from some of his letters, and mainly from his notes included in the copy box called Uber Marion's Berlin, 1905-1906, can mention be found. These are in the Craig collection in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. Irene Einat, the Israeli researcher, was the first to refer to them in an essay of 1980. Sometime later, Didier Plassard, the French author, and then Hannah Riebe, researching the history of the Swiss puppet theatre, discussed the contents of these copybooks. If we want to be sure of what Craig understood by his word Uber Marionette, we must return to Craig's first use of the term and follow the organisational progress of the international theatre of the Uber Marionettes, so as to learn what kind of material form he planned for this new actor. Then we would see, as Irene and Einard claimed, in spite of the generally held opinion, that in fact, though Craig's writing is often poetic, the Uber Marionette was not originally intended as a metaphor. Hannah Ribby took the same view when she referred to Uber Marions. Confirming Einat, Ribby added that the Uber Marionette was a concrete theatre concept. Following the statements of Einat and Ribby, I'm also assuming that the Uber Marionette was, at least at first, a personal project meant to be applied to a proposed company and by, uh, run by Craig. It wasn't to be a panacea for all the diseases of the existing theatre, but was the concept of an individual artist intended for his own work and not to be applied to theatre art as a whole. At the beginning of the 20th century, Craig's manifesto was taken as offensive. It is not difficult to understand his opponents, who saw in it an attack on the essence of theatre, since for centuries the theatre had depended on great actors. Craig suddenly made a serious mistake, attributable to his egocentricity, in presenting a personal conviction as though it was a universal truth. In addition to the problem of the actors, Craig collected other negative experiences in the various collaborations with theatre managers. He may well have supposed that other such disappointments awaited him, so it was hardly surprising that Craig, with the continuing support of Count Kessler, deliberated on starting up his own enterprise. There would be sympathy from many other eminent personalities from the artistic world for such a project, and they talked about founding it in a theatre in Dresden, to be called the Internationales Theater der Ubermarionette. A, a committee composed of these eminent personalities, including Henry Irving, Hugo von Hoffenstahl, Gerhard Hauptmann, August Strindberg, Isadora Duncan, and Eleonora Duse, was to coordinate all the preparatory works aimed at the opening of the Dresden Theatre. It was to be guided by Count Kessler as the chair. The project was magnificent in all respects. Starting with the desire to construct a purpose-built theatre, the committee even commissioned sketches. Sorry, I keep pressing the wrong thing. Um, uh, starting with the desire to construct a purpose-built theatre, the committee even commissioned sketches of a stage, an auditorium, and a lighting system. All this was, of course, only on paper. Unfortunately, all these documents exist today and are available to researchers. The theatre was to employ 80 people, including dancers, athletes, and performers, who would be complemented by 25 to 30 uber marionettes. In these documents, he mentions neither actors nor puppeteers, only manipulators intended to animate the uber marionettes. His sketches present a combination of people and artifacts. They demonstrate how the action of the figures would be staged, synchronized with the suppliers of the voices hidden behind the set. The term uber marionette appeared for the first time in a Craig text of July the 15th, 1905. Craig specified the heights and indicated the co-performers. The uber marionette, he had a wonderful voice. The uber marionette of the average size will be from four and a half feet to eight feet. Heroes and other important figures will measure from five to five and a half feet and even six feet. Gods, six and a half feet or more if necessary, besides athletes, dancers, acrobats, 
and models. He clearly foresaw a hierarchy of figures carrying a symbolic meaning relevant to the content of the show. Craig prepared a list of the plays he wanted to produce, it included some he'd already done, such as Dido and Aeneas and others of that period, dramas by Maeterlinck, a Faust, a Macbeth, a Temptation of St. Anthony by Flaubert. On the list was a Dusa play, a piece in three parts, woman's life, woman's love, woman's death. Craig's staging concept for these seems simple today. In 1905, it was revolutionary. Only Dusa will speak. The others will move around her as in a dream. Masks and uber marionettes. Craig immersed himself in his project emotionally and intensively, as much in relation to its organizational progress as its terminology. He wrote to Kessler in a letter of August the 13th, 1905, about the essence of the uber marionette as follows. Please remember one thing about this Dresden thing. These marionettes are not marionettes. They're more than marionettes and more than actors, having the virtues of both and the vices of neither. I particularly want the word marionettes not to come out. It suggests the doll at once. All must remain a mystery. I can tell you more when I see you. I speak very ill in words. Unfortunately, dark clouds were gathering over the Craig project. In the middle of the year, 1906, the potential sponsors decided to analyze its financial aspect, and it soon became clear the expenditure plan by Craig was beyond their expectations, and more crucially, their financial resources. The board of the exhibition Deutsches Kunstgewerbe in Dresden, reacting to these signals, declared it had no intention of participating in such an expensive project. And soon the, the other potential sponsors followed this decision. <coughs> the name of Craig's ideal actor was the only survivor of the Dresden adventure. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> To comfort him, Isadora Duncan promised financial support so that the Dresden project might be realized in another place. This other, other place was Florence. But unfortunately, high expenses she had uh, incurred herself meant she couldn't keep her promise. Even this didn't discourage Craig from his research and from new ideas taking shape in his head. Cheers. Irene Einat says, with reason, that Craig was now looking for new scenic materials, which might serve his productions, with kinetic architectural elements. All of this sounds quite innocent, with no threat to actors. If he was searching to create a friendlier climate for his experiments by finding a better name for his invention, he nonetheless referred again to his discomfiture while working with actors. Perhaps in presenting his ideas so arbitrarily, he simply wanted to stir the pot. Hence the publication of the essay, the, <coughs> <coughs> the actor and the uber marionette, in March 1906 issue of The Mask. The gauntlet was flung down. And three years later, he repeated the provocation in the collection of the seminal writings on the art of the theatre, where the theatre world read this infuriating statement. The actor must go, and in his place comes the inanimate figure, the uber marionette we may call him, until he has won for himself a better name. These words would sound merely intriguing if Craig had not gone on to elaborate the nature of the uber marionette through the specific qualities of the puppet. It was immediately understood that Craig wished to replace the actor by an as yet undefined but certainly man-made puppet. Actors took his words as a slur on their honour. In the second part of the 19th century, they had gained the privileged st status of stars and did not understand, as audience favourites, how anyone could think them redundant. They thought Craig was a madman who had no place in theatre, I can tell you, an awful lot of theatre people still do in this country. 
Although Craig was taking advantage of his fascination for puppetry, shown at the end of the 19th century, it was not he who gave it its initial impulse. Ten years earlier, Morris Maitanink and Alfred Jarry had pointed out the attractions of puppets as actors. Aurélien Lunier Poe used them in his Théâtre de l'Oeuvre in Paris, as did other artists, especially in Russia. The interest generated by French and Russian modernists was spreading all over all Europe, including Germany. Craig gave the movement its most extreme form. In the same year, another American critic, Floyd Dell, reacted similarly, although he expressed appreciation for Craig as a dreamer and a prophet of the theater. Craig read his article and responded with a letter, which fortunately remains in the archives of the Newberry Library in Chicago. The letter includes explanations concerning the nature of the Uber marionette. He, the Uber marionette, is to appear surely enough and probably my fussing about him before he appears will damage the success of his advent. And I'd realized that while I was about it, I should have been more particular to go into detail. This I could not do. The thieves have already stolen too much from me and turned the goods into at least a million marks and my cause can't spare another penny. But because I could not tell all about the new actor and because I drew here and there a herring across a trail, I somehow feel disappointed that you did not fight shy of that whole subject, the UN, and confine yourself to the other questions. Do go often to the Grand Opera, and when you go, take my assurance that I value the voice and all that is so divinely human, and that I should be just as delighted as you if we find that my uber marionette has a voice, heart, head, and all just as we have, but without the fat, without the madness and the misery. We are left in a fog of insinuation. We recognize the allusions to the feared robbery of Craig's ideas by Max Reinhardt's designers. Otherwise, his words can only be taken as an expression of indecision concerning the nature of his uber marionette. This is another proof. Craig was an artist open to a variety of impulses, constantly searching for new openings and avenues. His ideas were not dogmatic at all. On the contrary, they were unfixed and free depending on the mercurial state of his thoughts and the effects of his experiments. Discussion around the Uber marionette lasted many years and would still be going on if not for Craig's famous declaration in the preface to the next edition of his book on the art of theatre. Here he gave a new definition, stating, the Uber marionette is the actor plus fire minus egoism, the fire of the gods and demons without the smoke and stream of mortality. The advocates of actors' theatre were relieved to read this new definition. They were now able to treat the uber marionette as metaphor, a creation of Craig's poetic language. Now we go to Florence, where he was making preparations for a school in an amazing space, a sort of amphitheatre, called the Arena Goldoni. For the school program, Craig claimed the learning would have a practical aspect, which would consist of experiments in movements, the use of light, dancing, mime, as well as expression with inanimate objects. He collected books for the school library and bought theatrical objects such as masks and puppets from Burma and Java. Many of the students took part in the model theatre experiments, work that had started well before the school was founded. It began in Florence, where he was recovering from his frustration at the failure of the Dresden project and was regaining his forces to plan a new life. The abandoned theatre, which he rented in 1908, the Arena Goldoni, primarily was intended for workshops, a school and his editorial headquarters, and it had space enough to construct model theatres, where at last he could realise his ideas. Over two years, 1907 to 1908, Craig cut and sculpted the flat figures for his model theatre. They were 17 to 26 centimetre high and placed among the screens, the famous screens about which we heard so, so much, so vividly from um, 
uh, the last speaker, Professor Bonner. At first he called them his white figures and then his black figures. They were of unseasoned wood in various natural shades with only a few of them painted. They were of different sizes in proportion to the existing perspective. Each was given a different pose to evoke the impression of a speaking character or group of characters, but some had mechanisms to move the limbs. An individual figure might be programmed to convey specific gestures. For example, Craig manufactured one figure which crossed the stage slowly, keeping her head in a book. She stopped, lowered her hand to the book, and then bowed her head. In this way, Craig was analysing the possibilities of the most simple, controlled movement, which would incorporate both an image of the physical action as well as essential information about the character's state of mind. That model theatre was destroyed during military activity in Italy in the 1914-18 war. All seemed promising, and Craig's friends hoped that his experiments would continue fruitfully. However, the outbreak of war brought great changes to his life. The school was closed because the Italian army requisitioned the arena, wreaking devastation on his collection of materials. He now lost heart for research, a rupture that to a degree proved permanent. He was never able to recommence his laboratory work on the same scale as before the war. He, however, valued his experiments in model theatre too much to abandon them altogether. He soon returned to them since they gave him a feeling of continuation with his theatre work. He even recreated some of his previously realised productions. His ideas became once more a constant feature of many theatre design exhibitions. Usually Craig was there in person, putting the settings in motion. His black and white figures were greatly appreciated and several publishers were interested. It was as if the post-war appreciation of Craig's graphic works had left their theatrical origins in oblivion. His son, Edward Jr., in Florence, was helping his father, Florence, in Rome, I think, with the creation of the theatre he called Model A, especially in the solution of technical problems. Craig worked systematically and made visible progress but the results weren't open to the public. Par paradoxically, everything fell apart just when both inventors seemed to be approaching the happy end of their endeavours. Edward Jr. had made satisfying progress solving the problem of the vertical mo movement of cuboids in the playing space and other forms of scenery, having acquired hydraulic elevators. Craig could now make his cubes move not only from side to side, but equally well upwards and downwards. In fact, it was a triumph of stage engineering from the technical point of view. I don't know whether anybody here saw Robert Lepage's uh, Needles and Opium, but it is exactly that that Lepage seems to have developed in the most magical way in that show. <coughs> the, the huge cuboid which took up the whole of the theatre space, the playing space. Edward Jr. enjoyed this moment of happiness so much that he told his father how much a friend of his, an Italian student of hydraulics, had appreciated his ideas. Craig Sr. flew into a rage and even fainted, exhausted by his own blaze of anger. We recall his obsession with the belief that his work was in danger of plagiary because of dishonest people prying into his secrets. Mortally offended, he called Edward a traitor and ordered his now controversial Model A to be put in the cellar. It was never seen again. Not unrelated to his work in model theatre, with the black and white figures as its actors, Craig regularly manifested his interest in puppets. Let's see if I can find one or two. Those are the copies of the marionette, the six. That is a, a, a marionette made out of paper, which exists in Eton College. It wasn't one of Craig's own publications, it was a publication in London, but it's rather a lovely thing. Eton College has a huge collection of his work. There's Caliban, that's one of the puppets which I think was meant for pr pr production by the students of the arena. 
and that's another beautifully carved pieces of a marionette. The puppet in its many forms was almost certainly the starting point for his thinking on the impersonal theatre. He read a lot about the subject, especially in the second half of the 19th century, sorry, especially as the second half of the 19th century saw the publication of some important books on the history of the genre. The influence of the famous Histoire des Marionnettes en Europe by Charles Magnin was strong, especially in the chapter on hieratic puppets. Hieratic, in this case, means stately, royal, stately, majestic, with not an awful lot of movement, which must have held significant discoveries for him. All this influenced his theory of the Uber Marionette. In the same year that he published his essay, The Actor and the Uber Marionette, in 1908, he also wrote a manifesto. Gentlemen, the marionette published in The Mask in October 1912, and in 1919 included in his book The Theatre Advancing. Craig felt that some essential element of the puppet was shared with his long dreamt of ideal, the Uber Marionette. Both, in his view, had a similar history and virtues. He wrote, there is only one actor, nay, one man, who has the soul of the dramatic poet and who has ever served as true and loyal interpreter of the poet. This is the marionette. So let me introduce let me introduce it to you. Gentlemen, the marionette. Silently he waits until his masters signal him to act. And then in a flash and in one inimitable gesture, he readjusts the injustice of justice, the illegality of the law, the tragic farce of religions, the broken pieces of philosophies, and the trembling ignorance of politics. I love his style. I love his writing style. And what other virtues can I name besides these two? Of silence and obedience. I think these were enough. This exaggerated eulogy harmonized perfectly with his visionary style. It's hardly worth discussing his feebly grounded thesis that the marionette might save the theatre and rescue the world. However, his decision to stress the most valuable features of the puppet, i.e. silence and obedience, supported his views very well. The actor did not possess these qualities, and the marionette had them in high degree. This mental and emotional embrace had practical results. When he was gathering equipment for the future school, he ordered some puppets to be made. Edward Jr. described one. An experimental marionette, eight feet high, was made by the carvers, and attempts were made at manipulating it. Typical of the Italian craftsmen, on the day it was finished, they hurriedly rigged it, suspending it from a platform 20 feet up. And as Craig arrived, the giant figure bowed, and with slow gestures addressed him in Italian, wishing him good luck in all his enterprises. There were many other puppets in the school, although nobody knows how many or how they were used. Several are now the property of the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, as a part of the Craig collection. The puppets and other figures were animated with hieratic dignity and gesture, as in sacred performances given to celebrate the presence of a god. In 1921, Craig wrote that such movements should propose the actor, the puppet, as the actor's primer believing that actors in contact with the puppet could only benefit, and I agree. He advised manipulation exercises with a puppet every morning. It's obvious, at least to me, that Craig did not proclaim the necessity of replacing actors by puppets as a general precept. He wanted to use figurative substitutes to help bring to the stage his own scenic ideas and vision. From earlier plans, we recall he was happy to give special place to actors among the puppets and uber marionettes. He wanted to found a total theatre, although in his time, this notion was not in currency. For all his interest, Craig never found the energy for the foundation of a modern puppet theatre, perhaps because he dissipated this energy in the organisation of his school. In the editing of The Mask, 
and in his experiments with model theater, but the disaster of the war changed everything, freeing him from many of his duties. And suddenly, puppets engaged his full attention. Apparently, spontaneously, he started to write short plays for them. Craig's plays for puppets were not pure fantasy, but theatrical projects intended to be realized. Craig called the plays scenes, or interludes, or motions. In Shakespeare's time, the word motion meant a puppet show. Craig wrote his first motions for puppets in 1914. His systematic method of work began with one called Prologue, written in several versions. Here we find the puppet characters deliberating on their existential status. Craig went further in recalling tradition by handing over the puppet's authorship to a fool, Tom Fool, Craig's pseudonymous signature for all these dramatic miniatures. Craig's son Edward claimed that his first puppet play was written with the intention of presenting it for his children in a home puppet theater. The temperament of the father caused the idea to be changed. His plays were for everybody, certainly not only for children. Judging from prologue, the short play was meant to test the medium in the context of a new theater. So when Craig's family came from England to Rome during the war, 1917, his plans for the new puppet theater were not so much for children as with the help of children. According to his son, Craig treated the new project very seriously. He began to take a great interest in other Italian puppet theatres and conceived the mad idea of turning his giant Roman studio into a puppet theatre where everything would be worked by himself, Elena and the children and where his drama for fools could go on continuously. He was going to write 365 of these playlets. Once again, his ideas were never realized. Craig left only the ones written over a period of 10 years, most of them in 1916. He tried different themes as if to test them with puppets. He was searching for a dramatic form most suitable for puppet play, although he was no slave to the medium. From the very beginning, Craig was proving that his use of it was to further his general theatrical ideas. He uses literary themes and figures of known artists in the motions with satirical intent. They are some of them very funny. In this series, he was gradually adding to his staging resources through the use of different means of expressions, shadows, puppets, mannequins, people. Multimedia theater is undoubtedly another of Craig's inventions. What was Craig's intention when he wrote these short plays? besides the possibility of producing them in a family puppet theater. Perhaps the answer lies in the manifestos he published in his new magazine, The Marionette. We've shown those, haven't we? Showed those. The six little booklets. Um, edited in Florence from 1918 to 1919. He printed some of the motions in it, and some were printed in other periodicals. A series was published between 1918 and 1921 and given an introduction to the essay, Marionette Drama, some notes for an introduction to the drama for fools. The collection he, he always referred to as the drama for fools. In 1918, marionettes had apparently taken the place of the Uber marionette. Craig transferred to the characters all the attractive characteristics which he had some time ago attributed to his ideal actor. In an essay signed by Tom Fool, we read, what are marionettes? Men without egoism. What are men? Egoists. They walk, sleep, read, write, play, visit, eat, drink, and work as egoists. And more, they think, feel through egotism, see through it, hear through it. They soak it up like sponges. Once well filled in every pore, and we have what we call a man. A marionette walks, sleeps, prays, visits, eats, drinks, seems to do all these things exactly as men do, but what makes him so fresh, so free from a something detestable, something which haunts us when we see real men, is that this awful thing, egoism, is not with them. And what is the puppet drama? It's something completely different from the proper drama. 
Craig demonstrated the differences. Perhaps one of the chief distinctions between a drama for marionettes and a proper drama is this. Whereas a proper drama has to be vague and roundabout in its movements, a marionette drama had always better be direct and rapid and even obvious. With the proper drama, so much can be helped along by the actor. For example, if the author wishes to draw a subtle character like Iago, he can do so, making him seem to be quite a pleasant personage. For the actor who completes the work will explain, by additional exercises of subtlety, that he is not as pleasant as a personage as the, author, as the audience might suppose. Now, a marionette can't do that. A marionette is not at all clever, not subtle. He must fit the character like a glove, or all is undone. Therefore, when we make a character in one of our dramas, we make the marionette to fit it. And so it comes about that a marionette does not play a number of parts, he plays only one, that is, himself. This is different from the actor who plays many parts and must therefore pretend. The marionette never pretends. Therefore, the marionette can save the theater. The number of themes in these plays is astonishing, as is their variety. They have been collected and are now to be found in the Institut International de la Marionnette in Charleville, France. Craig's sense of humor shines through, the words revealing his attitude to real life as the source of his satirical inspiration, which, by the way, targeted not only his adversaries, such as Reinhardt, but also admired friends, such as Henry Irving. He always wanted to be an activist within the arts of theater. Having a clear vision of his work, he awarded himself the right to choose any medium of expression he wanted. While appreciating the artistry of the best actors, he believed he might discover another ideal actor in the form of the Uber marionette. Scenic perfection he approached through the intermediary of material and a non-personal means of expression in figurative form. He saw that the scenic figures, the decor, in the hands of true artists are capable of generating metaphor. He was the first to bring visual poetry to the theater, to the stage. For the theater people of his time, this was difficult to understand. All of them thought that the main task of any theater artist was to work with and through a script and a group of actors. And an awful lot of theater makers still believed the same thing. Craig's theories appeared to destroy existing dogma, especially since he described the current practice as a dead end. Instead of finding his way within conventional theater resources, he invented a new world of substitutes. However, if we stop to think about his enthusiastic engagement with each of his substitutes, we have to acknowledge that for the accomplishment of all his dreams, he found fascinating forms and perspectives, whether it be the Uber marionette, the thousands of scenes in one scene, the puppet theater, placing all these dreams in a rich cultural context. I'll end, this is me now, I'll end by quoting Susanna Clapp, theater critic of The Observer. In 2008, she wrote, gifted and charming, Craig strode the fine line between the visionary and the barking. He was fascinated by marionettes, a fascination that now looks prescient. In some of the most imaginative theatrical events of the past decade, shock-headed Peter and war horse, human beings have jostled alongside puppets. As usual, he got carried away. He decided the theater might be better if cleared of involvement with fleshy people, such as actors and authors. He looked forward to the rule of the Uber marionette. Thank you. <laughs>